First this hour, England have been beaten by Greece for the first time in their history. Inter manager Lee Carsley named an experimental team with no recognised striker for the Nations League Group B game and his side was soundly beaten. As Greece won 2-1 at Wembley, they also had three goals disallowed. England were also indebted to Levi Colwell who pulled off sensational goal line clearance to deny Greece another goal following a mistake by Jordan Pickford. Greece took the lead through Vangelis Pavlidis four minutes into the second half. The entire Greek team then came together to dedicate the goal to teammate George Baldock after his sudden death at the age of 31. It stayed 1-0 until the 87th minute when Jude Bellingham came to England's rescue with a shot from outside the box, his first goal of the season reviving memories of his heroics against Slovakia at this summer's Euros. But the joy was short-lived. Pavlidis scoring a deserved winner for Greece in stoppage time after England repeatedly failed to clear the ball in the box. A first feat then for Lee Carsley in his third game in charge and next it is Finland at Wembley on Sunday. The only player that can come away from it and say yeah I played pretty decent would be Palmer. Even though he missed a big chance early on he was getting on the ball he's playing you know decisive passes in between the lines and that's how again he was part of the move where Bellingham scored but I think overall it's just poor. I think Lee Carsley really needs to look at this and say, OK, we've got some great players, but we need to put it together to make a great team. And that's the most important thing, because all the nations that are successful, you know, the likes of Spain, like I said before 2012, where Fabregas is playing up there, you've got Iniesta on the left. You've got Xavi Alonso, you've got Xavi, Busquets, you know, and I mean, you've got some top class players, but and I'm not saying England still have like world class players that can go and do things like that. But at the moment, it's just that understanding and it's not quite come together yet, but it is early days and like I'm going to keep. Saying it, Lee Carsley himself said, we've only worked on this for three days, so I'm not going to berate Lee Carsley and say what's he doing. I think it's something that England are going to have to work on now going forward. Well, both sides had 12 shots, but Greece scored from there too that were on target. England had nearly twice as many attacks, nearly twice as many corners and nearly twice as much possession but remember that Greece had three goals ruled out. Very disappointing night for England. Can you put your finger on where it went wrong? Yeah, I think everyone can see that we weren't our best level tonight and we're disappointed with ourselves, but setbacks happen in football and then you can learn from them a lot. But we've got a quick turnaround and we've got to get it right for Sunday against Finland and go and put a performance. There were a lot of attacking players on the field tonight. You could see it all in front of you. Was it a little bit too open? No, no, you know they're going to create chances. It's about if you know if you're attacking going forward with a lot of players and you've got to be mindful of them transitions. And a lot of the times, most of the time we dealt with that well and we got caught out a couple of times. But that's football. And like I say, you can you can learn from them. Mistakes were disappointed tonight, not getting the result at Wembley. And as a nation, we'll all be disappointed. But we need to learn from it thick and fast because it's a game Sunday. Is that what it's all about now learning the lessons from this one? Because as you say, it is a very quick turnaround. Yeah, you've always got to learn. You know, you're never you're never going to be perfect, even when you're winning games. So you can you can learn a lot from games like tonight. And what can we do better as a team and how can we move forward? But it's about recovering well and getting ready for Sunday. Well, to make matters worse for England and more pertinently for Arsenal, Bukayo Saka picked up an injury in the first half as Saka seemed to be feeling at the back of his leg as he went off before being assessed by England's medical staff. There is no indication yet of the nature or the severity of the injury. Right, Gary, give us your verdict on what you've seen from Manchester United today. I mean, I think it's a small step forward. I think before the game, if you'd offered any Manchester United fan, probably player and coach, a draw, then they would have snapped your hand off. And I think that's where at the end of the game, Eric Ten Hag's interview, I think there was an element of relief because he obviously just keeps the Wolves at bay for a couple of weeks. I think it gives him a little bit more time. I don't think that anybody that thought that there was going to be a sort of major incident after today's game thought it would happen with a draw. They always thought it would need to be another difficult day, another difficult defeat like it was last weekend against Tottenham. So I think it buys a little bit of time, but I mean, it's Manchester United's worst start in Premier League history. So, I mean, we can't really over celebrate. I'm speaking here as obviously someone who's on Sky as a pundit, but also as a United fan when we're thinking that actually it's a decent point when you draw at a villa. 
That tells you how far Villa have come, but it also tells you how low the bar is for Manchester United at this moment in time. Yeah, and I suppose particularly concerning is this staggering lack of goals. What is it 5-7 games into the season? Is that the first point that needs to be addressed? Yeah, but when you rely upon moments, which obviously, Dave, we've talked about this now for two years, you rely upon moments. What you end up happening with is if players go into a dip in form or you have injuries, obviously Hodgland's been injured, Rashford's had a dip in form, Bruno's going through a rare sort of difficult patch for him when it comes to goals. So then you end up in a situation whereby you haven't got the patterns of play. You haven't got the sort of, if you like, the combinations to rely upon that can maybe get people goals. And I don't think Manchester United also, they're not very good on set pieces either. So that's the problem. You play in moments, you end up if players lose form, you don't score in moments. And that's exactly what's happening at this moment in time. Manchester United have somehow got to find a way of playing where patterns develop and people are telepathic and they make the runs without even knowing. And it doesn't happen. I mean, the front four of United today, Garnacho, Rashford, Hojund and Fernandes, is a front four that a lot of, I think, top teams would look at and think, that's not a bad top four. It's not a bad front line, yet it doesn't look dangerous at all as a combination. I always think of the front three that played for Liverpool, Salah, Firmino, man. They played in combination. They played together. They were close to each other at times. United front four, to be fair, I don't think connect with each other at any point in the game. The front two for Villa, Rodgers and Watkins, they combine with each other. They play with each other on the pitch. They know what each other's going to do. United just don't have that. So where does this then leave, Gary, the conversation around the manager, Eric Ten Hag? This pressure has been building all the way from the summer to this tricky start to the season. Playing this game out today in front of all the United hierarchy, what conclusions do you think they go away with? They definitely won't want to do anything, Dave, this season. I think I've said that before. No club wants to sack a manager during a season because it's not only a reflection upon the manager, it's a reflection upon them. Even though, obviously, Ineos have only come into the club in the last few months from a point of view of actually taking control of the football side, and Dan Ashworth and Omar Barada have only been in the club for a couple of months. So you can't really sort of land the blame at the door. They're going to need two or three years, four years to try and sort this out. But obviously the club did make the decision to keep Eric Ten Hag in the summer and they don't want to have to basically reverse that decision after only six or seven games. So they've just got to hope in this next couple of weeks through maybe a reset, maybe some sort of thinking time, some planning. Obviously with Manchester United fans, coaches, players have talked about this new structure that surrounds Eric Ten Hag. It needs to go to work quite quickly in this next few weeks because I think if the next international break comes around and Manchester United are still in that sort of 13th, 14th position in the league, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure building. So the next few weeks are critical in making sure that they can somehow get some momentum for the rest of the season so that Eric Ten Hag can keep his job because no United fan wants to see Eric Ten Hag lose his job either. That just again feels like we're on a roundabout, just spinning the same way as we have done for the last 10, 12 years. He was bullish, wasn't he? As you've already referenced, perhaps admirably so after the game. But like you say, it does feel like we are going to go month to month with him. The bigger picture, Gary, is around Manchester United as a club and their progress. They're 14th right now, regardless of who the coach is. How do you see them making headway? So again, we're talking about a side challenging for Champions League football again as a starting point. I mean, I thought they would be challenging for Champions League football this season. Obviously, naively, it looks like at this moment in time, but to be 14th, I mean, that just can't happen. You know, it can't continue that they can stay in 14th without repercussion. It's unforgivable with the money spent. The investment in the squad in the summer, Everyone regarded Manchester United's transfer market as being smooth and it was a lot smoother than had happened in previous years. You didn't see the failing to get targets and you also saw players coming in without a lot of fuss which was welcomed by everybody. 
But since the start of the season, you know, Eric Ten Hag's got no excuses. Now all the players are fit. The players are all there on the pitch. They're his players. I mean, look at today. He's had to revert to Harry Maguire, obviously, who maybe we thought was leaving United 18 months ago, and Johnny Evans, who's obviously getting on in years, and his first choice partnership of De Ligt and Martinez. You know, we're on the bench. I know that obviously De Ligt came on, but they were the players that were supposed to get Manchester United up the pitch, play that higher line, be more aggressive, get that style implemented that Eric Ten Hag wanted to implement when he first came to United. You know, we seem to be going one step forward and two steps back. And to be fair, at this moment in time, it's a real struggle. How you even look at Champions League at this moment in time, you can't. And that's a problem for Ineos. I think that in terms of the sustainability of the financial rules, United are right on the edge. So they've got to try and bring extra revenues in at this moment in time. And not being in the Champions League causes them a big problem in more ways than one. Let's go to the front page of The Sun, which is quite a dominant headline and obviously quite a big call to put it on the front page of the paper heading into Saturday. Hidden device taps, Manchester United dressing room, 10 hag team talks recorded at Villa Park and again, that play on Fergie's famous line, squeaky bug time. It's not a nefarious plot this though, Martin, is it? The quoted here by Amir Razavi and Richard Moriarty is it was a prankster. Is this more of a reflection on Aston Villa's security that someone was allowed to get into the dressing room here? Yeah, pretty, pretty major security breach, really. Apparently, this was a message United fan somehow taped a phone which was then activated by another phone so that it came on and actually recorded the team talk from Eric Ten Hag ahead of the Aston Villa match. Looking at the actual match itself, I don't think it could have been a very exciting team talk. But nevertheless, United, I'm sure, be very alarmed that this has happened and what should be top secret information is actually being accessed. And I mean, the Sun said they've listened to it. They've not published it, but it certainly was very, very audible. What's your take on this, Ian? Tough time for Ten Hag. We're all talking about whether he should lose his job or not. This probably adds to his problems, I'd imagine. Not a nice story necessarily. I mean, first of all, it's an absolutely superb tabloid red top exclusive. It's a jaw-dropping story actually when I sent it half an hour before the show started, I couldn't quite believe it. To think that somebody's got into a Premier League dressing room the day before a big game like that, and also the story says went back in again on the Monday to retrieve the phone, is quite extraordinary and I'll be really interested to see what Aston Villa have to say about it when they look into it and find out who did it or how it happened. This story is one that will run for a few days, I would imagine, without being too dramatic about it. It's a major security breach. It did make me smile when I read that The Sun had decided not to run the details of Eric Ten Hag's team talk. I could only imagine that it maybe didn't make an awful lot of sense. Fascinating, well, very organized defense in that match and a clean sheet, maybe that was the emphasis of the team talk. We'll never know. Sun making a big call. I suppose it could have got a lot of attention with that, but choosing not to. Will it be a new director of football or will it be a sporting director? I say it like that because Manchester City are, we understand, closing in on an agreement for Hugo Viana to come here to the City Football Academy and replace Tsiki Bigarastain. Hugo Viana is currently the director of football at Sporting in Lisbon. It's a role where he's enjoyed some plenty of success over the last six years in tenure, two league titles in that six years including last summer when they won the title for the first time in three seasons and his role in helping them return to the top of Portuguese football has been credited. He's put them in a position where they're top of the Portuguese table once again and fans in the Premier League might remember Hugo Viana as a young potentially talented young player coming in from Portugal when he joined Newcastle in the early 2000s. Now that was an underwhelming stint in English football, it has to be said. He didn't quite live up to the expectation but since he's developed his career, went on to be a Portuguese international player, but certainly since he's retired is when he's had most impact. Remember we brought you the news earlier this week that Tsiki Begristain was going to be stepping down or expected certainly to step down this summer. At the age of 60, expected that this was the time where he'd already hung on, worked with Pep Guardiola and brought such a tremendous era of success here to Manchester City. 
Remember, he joined the club in 2012, so all of the trophies that line the walls of the honours boards here at the City Football Academy were under the stewardship of Tisiki Bagirastain and in this room, Pep Guardiola has spoken at length about the impact and importance of his good friend Tisiki. Remember, the pair of them were at Barcelona together, so they've had that ongoing working relationship which is understood to be certainly coming to an end this summer. The interesting thing about Hugo Viana and potentially this deal getting close now is that City want to have the new man, the replacement for Tiksiki Begairistain to be here in post with maybe a six-month handover so he can work alongside Begairistain in the final part of this season. Understand what makes Manchester City tick and perhaps even build that relationship with Pep Guardiola whose own future remains uncertain. We've still had nothing concrete either way on whether he will choose to stay beyond the end of his contract which expires in the summer, so certainly seems as though Manchester City have taken a big step forward in this potential appointment. Some reports suggesting Viana could even be in post by as early as next week, 